this talk is answer to prayer. So answer to prayer at every stage, Brother Perry was talking about believing us, uh, believing that we are going to get answers. And I'm very confident that God has allowed me to speak today about answer to prayer because he wants to do something wonderful. So let's get started. Yes. So, um, yeah. I'm going to do my screen sharing, brother. Can I? Yes. Oh, yes, Sister Agnes. You're the host. Yes. Okay. So, yes. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So, praise the Lord. Yes. All glory to Jesus. So, today's talk is all about answer to prayer. I know and I believe that some of us are eagerly waiting to hear answers from the Lord. So am I. And I'm excited because this topic was given to me last night and I had to work on it overnight. Earlier, I wanted to talk about definite scripture passages in a moment of unworthiness, how to become worthy for the Lord's sake. I prepared that as well beautifully. But last night when I lifted up this morning's meeting, the Lord clearly said, no, answer to prayer. And we're going to look at answer to prayer from the life of Job. The story of Job in the Bible is something not new to us. We have known it many times, possibly. But today God wants to emphatically reason it out in your life and in my life. And so here we are to set the background for answer to prayer. We must believe, first of all, in the word of scripture. Believe in the Lord Jesus, you and your entire household shall be saved. So you and me, our entire household shall be saved. The answers to our need shall be got even by today is what the Lord has promised me. So how many of you are going to join with me and believe that God can answer our prayers today? Amen. Yes. So come, come, come into this meeting with an expectant faith. I know all of us have faith. All of you especially have a lot of faith. I know that. But I'm challenging you today, tonight, this evening, to come into this meeting with an expectant faith. Maybe two hours from now, you say, Lord, I want to see signs of my answer. I want to hear the rumblings in the heavens of the answer that has been unleashed from the heavens to reach me and my household. Today, God is promising answer not only to me, to my need, but to my household. Multiple answers, multiple requests are going to be answered today. So let me remind you, starting with Mark chapter 11, verse 24. This is something that you must always remember. I know Brother Perry has reminded us of this couple of times earlier in my own personal life. He has reminded me about this when he has prayed with me a couple of times. Therefore, I tell you, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So when we pray, we just don't leave it there. We wrap it up with the answer from ourselves, saying, Lord, we have already taken it out of your mouth, out of your providence, out of your provision. So when we ask for whatever we ask, let us believe and also seal it with the belief, the bit of belief, even if it's like a mustard seed. That's all the Lord wants. Okay. So I'm going to challenge you and me today to believe right now, whatever is your prayer request. Please make a note of it mentally. And as I get started, have faith in God, according to Mark chapter 11, verse 22. What should we do in order to get our answers? First criteria, first request, first provision is have faith in God. Who, in whom are we having our faith? Having, uh, are we having our faith in the government? Are we having our faith in the boss where we are employed? Uh, 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 or are we having our faith in the man that you married and the woman that you are living with, your uh, better half? No, no man can provide your answers. No person who loves you the most in the world can provide the answers. The God who has loved you and cared for you, who has created you, the ultimate creator, he is the answer to every need. So I want to remind you, have faith in God. Who is the God that we worship? He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. So I may go 
but my generation should remember that it's not me who is the answer to any of their needs. It is my God whom they should also serve, hopefully in the days to come, who will be the answer to their need. And so nicely, Mark 11, in the same paragraph, I spoke to you about verse 24. I ran you through verse 22. Now, in between, there's the clause. Mark 11, 23. What does it tell you? Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, we have issues, some of us, how many months I'm asking for the same answer it's yet to be given to me? How many months I'm knocking at the same doors? It still hasn't opened for me. Maybe that's the mountain that you're faced with today. The Lord says, go throw yourselves into the sea. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his or her heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. When we attend an online, uh, let's say a prayer meeting or a adoration, and they are claiming the healing, at that time, you have to believe, you have to tune your faith with the faith of the preacher and say, yes, there is power in the blood. He's preaching about the blood of Jesus, let's say. You stop worrying about all that is worrying you at that point and just raise your heart and say, okay, for that moment, I'm also believing in the power of the blood that was shed 2000 years ago. And when you do that, there's something like a click that happens in the heavenlies and your answer is unleashed just at that moment. I've seen this happen a couple of times now, and I realize how foolish I've been over the years, waiting for the answers, saying the same thing, but not actually believing in that moment when the answer is being declared by the preacher or by the anointed servant of God. At times you need that anointing to break the barriers and the anointing shall break the barriers. As it is said, the anointing of the Holy Spirit can break the barriers, can break any obstacles in front of you if you, if you are able to lend your faith to that working of the Holy Spirit at that point in time. So we must tune ourselves. It's like a radio being tuned to have the best reception. I've told you this earlier. I'm telling you this again because the Lord has clearly spoken to me today. Answer to their prayers will be promised, will be given in this prayer meeting. So I dare to believe what God has told me. And I'm sure that many of you are going to join me and believe, what is your problem? What is your need? What is your situation? There's no situation beyond the love of Jesus. There is no need that cannot be answered by the blood of Jesus. There is no Satan that cannot be rebuked by the power of his blood. So we have to look into the provision that is already given to us. The ransom that was already paid on the cross of Calvary. Not only in this meeting, but possibly in every meeting, we should remember this. The answer to our need is already provided in the ransom that Jesus Christ paid by his passion and death on the cross. So what is it that you need today? Restoration, financial breakthrough, job opportunity, or confirmation of the employment, or release of peace into the household. I see some broken marriages getting sealed right now. I'm, dead. I'm daring to believe that brokenness in marriages can be offset can be reset, can be redone by the creative power of the Lord Jesus, even now, because that mountain is going to be thrown into the sea along with you and me. And we are going to just believe that God can do it even now as I'm talking. Remember now I'm moving on to the story of Job. So I've set the pace for you to remember that whatever you ask for in prayer, believe and you shall have it. Just have faith. And if you have faith as big as a mustard seed, it's enough to roll the mountain into the sea. So if you're going to do that right now, let me remind you, starting with the almost the last bit of Job's story. In Job 42.2, it goes like this. It says, Job is telling the Lord God, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be throttled. So you must believe like Job. He was a man of faith. He stood steadfast in faith, not in a very cushioned, very soft, very comfortable position. He was threatened. Everything about his life went topsy-turvy, upside down. Maybe in your life you are feeling some threatening positions, some threatening issues and situations, but still all your life has not been turned upside down. I too have been threatened a couple of times, maybe sometimes even more than an average um, woman of my age or a person of my background 
would have been threatened, but it was not all of it. Some portion of it, 20%, 40%, maybe 53%, whatever the percent, but not all of it. Let's remember that. Whereas Job, if you look at the actual story of Job, that man's life was totally shaken. A lot of things happened in his life. Let's look at how it went. In Job 1.3, it says he was a well-known man. He was just not an ordinary man of his time. He was well-known, well-placed, well-established, a man with a reckon. People knew him. People honored him. People uh, maybe even listened to him, obviously, with the money and the power and the position. Obviously, he would have been able to get the attention of the society, of the people, of the community in which he lived, in which he worked, in which he moved around. So Job 1.3 tells us that Job owned 7,000 sheep. It's important for you to remember these statistics because the answer to our need is coming just like how it happened in Job's situation. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, and 500 donkeys. Okay, That's a lot of cattle and livestock that God had supplied him with. And he had a large number of servants. You and me are not able to get one servant today. But remember in those days, they had such palatial houses, such big establishments. And God in his abundance had provided many servants for Job. He had, he, and he was the greatest man among all the people of the land, of that part of the East, of that part of the world. What a glorious uh, testimony to start with. What a wonderful painting on the wall about Job's grandeur and splendor and provision. And let's look at what happened in 119, Job 119. When all this was there, beautiful, lovely, wonderful, majestic, however you want to pronounce it, or whatever else you want to attribute to that glorious time of his life, there came a mighty wind suddenly. Job 119 runs us like this, through this word. When suddenly a mighty wind swept in, from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It's like what is happening in, in uh, I shouldn't talk politics here, but right now we are living in a war zone. It, the attack was not only from one front, all three fronts from the, from the air, from the land and from the sea. So what would you do in a moment of crisis like that? This is something similar to what happened in Job's life. All four corners of the house he had the wind attacking him. Obviously, there was no way for him to take refuge any side. Every side he turned, he was under attack. The house collapsed on them, whoever was inside the house. And they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. Whoever is coming to give him that sad news, that horrific news. That person is sharing this terrible news with Job. Can you imagine the sadness, the, the, the trauma, the anger, the frustration? He would have been taken so unawares. What will we do in a situation like that? Just can we think Job was as human as you and me. He was also uh, flesh and blood like you and me. And Job, in the very same paragraph, just one verse later, he says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. What a, what a philosophy that man should have had. What a wonderful servant of the loving God. How loving he should have been to God to say this. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. When few things, 2% of what we had is taken away, we start cribbing. When 20% of the joy or the comfort we have is eroded, we start grumbling. And when Half of it goes, what can you can imagine? You'll be throwing tantrums. I will also do the same. I'm sorry. We should not be doing that. But human as we are, we do that. We tend to do that. Look at Job. Even in that terrible, dire point of need, what did he say? I came without anything from my mother's womb. When I was born, I came empty-handed. And now, I will even when I go, I will go empty-handed. The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Even then, he's putting the Lord in the right perspective. It needs a lot of courage. It needs a lot of guts. It needs, a, uh, it needs a lot of passion to love the Lord like that with all your heart, with all your mind. That's what we are supposed to do, isn't it? That's what the catechism class teaches us. In the, in the first few years when we teach children, 
in the catechism classes, what do they tell them? Why did God make you? God made you to love him with all your heart, with all your mind. But are we doing it ever? Is a big question, a big challenge in front of us today. And in that moment, you can imagine the people around Job. Most of it is gone and maybe his wife is standing there uh, as desperate, as broken, as shattered, maybe as uh, terrified just as much as Job. And what was the immediate reaction out of that human agony, out of that human despair? What did she say? She just mocked him. His wife said to him in chapter 2, verse 9, Are you still maintaining your integrity, Job? Curse God and die, you man. She said that to him. She literally asked him to get out, leave this earth, but not before cursing God. She was so angry with God. She never had the thought or the thinking like her husband Job had. He put the Lord in the right perspective and he said God gave and God has a right to take it away whenever he wants to. But we would never be able to do that as human as we are. So many times God is the one who provides everything to us. So when we lose out something, did we early acknowledge that it came from God? We were so sad and bitter and so troubled why it went. But when it was there, did we acknowledge the provider? Did we acknowledge the source of it from where it came? And there are times when you and I have been very unworthy to have all of that. If the loving Jesus, the loving God provided that for us. Think of the times when your wife was the sweetest around you. Think of the times when you had a very sentimental attachment to the lady of the house. And where is that sentiment today? Why is it clouded with anger and disgust? Why is it clouded with hatred and maybe unforgiveness? Same, vice versa. What about the man you so lovingly walked down the aisle with? Why are you having apprehensions and fear and insecurities with the same man you're living a couple of years now? We should ask ourselves those questions. The same children whom we so lovingly bore and brought out, today they are a big uh, issue to us. Why? Have we done what we have to do with them all the time? Are they the ones to blame all the time? Or are we also partly to blame? I think it's a retrospective moment in life today as we are looking at the world out there, dying, shedding blood for some reason, maybe not even known to them why we are shedding our blood why this is happening to us, they are also in despair and uh, agony. And forget about the war. Now, in our own lives, we are having a, a, a war of insufficiency, a war of jealousy, a war of lack of faith. Even when you have no faith, you're living like in a war zone because you're allowing the enemy to take over. You're opening the doors of your heart and your li life and your house and say, come and take over because you're not stopping him with faith. All you need to do at that time was to speak to Satan. Resist Satan and he shall flee from you. Submit yourselves to God. That is the first sentence. The second sentence says, resist Satan and he shall flee from you. Did you submit that moment of crisis to the Lord? You're going interview after interview and not getting an answer. But did you really call the Lord to come with you for every interview? Did you ask the Lord to walk into that interview board room before you walked into that room? I've done the same mistake many times earlier. But today I've learned to put the Lord in the front. Lord, if you come with me, I shall go. If you are with me, I can do it. Maybe I'm not at all competent. I'm not at all capable in my human flesh. But when I say, Lord Jesus, are you there? Can you do it with me and for me? He is surely going to do it for me. Because I'm giving him the prime importance. How long does it take to do that? Instead of cribbing about the lady of the house who is maybe not managing affairs properly, she's not cutting the court according to the means, maybe she's overspending, overdoing it, or maybe the husband is earning more but not giving you sufficient. Instead of cribbing and worrying and being anxious, invite the Lord into that provision. Invite the Lord to take control of the pocket of the man who's having the money, the currency in the pocket. Invite the Lord into the cooking of your wife if she's not doing a good job, if she's doing a shoddy job. Ask the Lord, Lord, you take charge. You think he can't do it? He can, isn't it? When he did it for Job, why won't he do it for you and me? So let us not be a weakling. And um, when Job's wife said that, what was Job's reply to her? See, it's a classic, um, it's a classic statement that Job replies when his wife says, curse God and die. 
They're still holding on to integrity. At what cost? She was furious, obviously. She was furious. She was raging. He calmly replies to her. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Even in that point of loss, he's rationalizing. He's keeping a balance in his mind and heart, keeping his integrity intact. What a wonderful uh, model he has given to us to wait on the Lord. We wait on the Lord two hours, two days, two weeks. But the third week we are lost. But that is not the way to go forward. I've learned the waiting process a long time ago in a very hard circumstance. I was one who wanted results like this. But God never gave me any results for a long time. I had to wait, I had to wait and wait and wait. So I know what I'm saying. Learn to wait on the Lord. And then Job tells his wife, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, the second part of the sentence is what I want to emphasize. In all this disturbance, in all this prodding from his wife, in all this sad, harsh reality in front of him, around him, he did not sin with his lips. He did not sin with what he said. He had his lips sealed, not one negative, unwanted word from the lips of Job. Though he was righteous and he was righteously could have been angry and say many things in that moment of anger and despair, even to the Lord, I'm sure the Lord would have still been okay with it because he is at the man, at the crossroads of his life. He has faced such a huge tragedy. He has faced such a huge loss, but he did not do that. How did that, how can that be? How can this be is what question that we have to remember and realize. This is what the Bible teaches us. In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. How many times we lose our cool and shout? How many times we lose our cool and get irritated with people and with situations and circumstances? So let us remember that the tongue, life and death is in the power of the tongue. The same tongue with which you praise God, you cannot use the same tongue to curse. Not only God, to curse even your fellow human beings. Because you're called not to curse, you're called to bless. You're called to be um, a doer of the word. If you're a doer of the word, then you cannot use it to curse and to violate the norms and the teachings which the Lord has placed in front of you and me. And in this challenging moment only, we go back to the earlier verse in the same book of Job. That when Satan is the one who plays all this plot and he's the one who's planning all this to bring the downfall of Job. The Lord told Satan very confidently, very well then, when Satan prods him and says, Lord, you are, you're believing that your servant Job is going to be doing this. That's because you have fenced him around with your protection, with your favor. You have taken, taken care of him. You have provided all this for him. You are doing everything. So naturally, he's listening to you. He's uh, doing the things right. But God had confidence in his servant Job. What did the Lord say? The Lord told Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. Only up to the point of death, you can torture him almost. And that's exactly what Satan did very happily. Yes, so Satan took full charge, full control and smashed everything that had life around Job and that belonged to Job. The same thing, look at uh, for a minute, remember what happened in the life of Lazarus. You can ask, why was, where was the Lord when Job was being tormented like this? How dare Satan do this to him? How dare he kill all the livestock? How dare he burn down the house? How dare he take away all the children, the seven sons and the three daughters of Job? Everything went like a flash, like a flash of lightning. They were all together in the same premises. They were enjoying a party or whatever it was that was happening. And when the winds came from the four sides, everything went and with that, everything that belonged to Job, having life and purpose and splendor and money and worth, everything vanished. Everything was buried and made like a dead, mo uh, what do you say? That, uh, it was nothing there, absolutely nothing left. Remember the story of Lazarus. When Lazarus, God knew, Jesus knew what was happening to Lazarus well, well, much before what was actually going to happen. When he got the news that Lazarus was sick, he did not react. When they said Lazarus is dead, immediately he did not go. He waited. 
maybe we would think in a human spirit why didn't jesus go maybe if he had to go at least it would have been solace to the two sisters maybe when he was already sick when he heard if he had to go he could have extended his life all that we will be thinking in a human um, in a human thinking patterns but jesus said good now now you know that i was not there when such a thing happened and when the news of death came also he didn't panic he didn't rush immediately he just stalled it he waited and almost after four days of lazarus death lazarus died he was all the rituals were done he too was wrapped up with all the ceremonial rituals performed and he was put into the tomb and the huge stone of the practice of those times were put it was put to cover the tomb and he was there right inside buried dead for four days then jesus comes on the in the picture he comes on the spot and the the, the two sisters are very sad naturally and what did they say lord if only you were there but then he he challenges their faith and when jesus calls out to lazarus the dead man impossible for a man to receive that command of the lord right from top right into the tomb with all that that was his body was already cast into the preparations so he would not have been even able to hear in his human system yet at the command of the voice of the lord jesus he came forth totally alive still wrapped in all that clothes that was used to wrap him out fully like a tomb from top to down like a mummy of the eastern uh, egyptian times if the lord jesus can do that he wanted to do that to show his grace and power and splendor so he is the lord of all life he is the lord of all flesh he is the lord of all no there's no death the brother parry was saying that i was rejoicing when i heard that oh death where is your sting where is your control where is your power brother parry mentioned that in the earlier um, part of the meeting so where is the sting of death he could not conquer jesus jesus conquered it do you realize the power of the love of jesus do you realize the power of his word the magnitude of the situation lazarus was dead four days not one day not four hours not 40 hours four days and yet when he was resurrected by the by just the compassion and love of jesus he just called out to him come my friend and lazarus came and lived it is not a story that didn't happen it's a recorded history so now let's come back to job similarly in job 92 you know in the earlier portion of job it says indeed i know that this is true but how can mere mortals prove their innocence before god when job was being mocked by his friends maybe you did something like this maybe you did wrong maybe you were not loyal to the lord maybe you were having blemish that's why god allowed this nasty punishment on you the poor job was crying out in his heart he was righteous he had not actually done anything to warrant this it was satan who plotted and planned and brought the downfall of job not because job stopped being righteous not not because job did not uh, do right job was still doing only right he never sinned even in that point of neglect and loss and despair even before that he was a righteous man who lived his integrity who walked in integrity so what can mere mortals prove or do to prove their innocence before god before man sometimes you and me are in that spot today we are righteous in our own sight and maybe in the sight of our fellow beings but there are people who are like thorns in the flesh in our households maybe in the jobs that we perform maybe in the larger society where we live who want to mock us who want to ridicule us who want to put us to shame who want to keep finding fault with us for no fault of us they are ready to do it because they are under the banner of the power of the evil one maybe they are not to blame but they are allowing the evil one to warp their minds to warp their thinking so they are allowing themselves to be used for the the plan of the evil one to cause destruction in our lives see what job says in 19 verse 2 how long will you torment me and crush me with words when when job was desperate to prove his, his innocence even before god and his friends were tormenting him with words it's not just enough to torment you with blows many times we are tormented by the people around who live with us 
the psalmist, if you look at the psalms, if you read through some of the psalms, it says so beautifully, the people who are mine, they are the ones who cause the sadness and brokenness and hurt in our lives. Our own in-laws, for instance, the husbands, wives, or the rest of the family, the close associates, people who have lived with you, walked with you, ate with you, dined with you, could also become the cause of pain in our lives. But in all those times, God wants us to look at him. God wants us to put him in the focus. So now I'm coming to the end of the story of how Job conquered. The same Lord God whom Job served and believed. Now in that point of loss and despair, the Lord reminds the friends of Job, go, go back to Job. Do this, fulfill this command. Make Job pray for you. He, the Lord is look, almost still believing that Job will remain in integrity. Even at this point of despair and total uh, loss, he is still going to be able to fulfill the righteous cause to pray for his friends. Job 42 verse 8 says, it, the Lord is giving the command to the friends of Job. Go, so now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken the truth about me, but my servant Job has. So that's where you and me are called to the right perspective of being intercessors for God's glory. There are times the Lord will use us never to pray for ourselves, but to be used in that moment to intercede for others. Even in the point of pain and agony and self-pity and loss, even when our own lives are wallowing through a lot of crises, when we say obey the voice of the Lord and say, okay, Lord, this moment you want me to pray for somebody else who is maybe in a better need or in a worse need than me. When I do that, putting my focus on the Lord and the purpose of his calling in my life, then like how Job did pray and how God answered the prayer of Job, for his friends, and then you see there's a twist in the story. So according to verse 9 in chapter 42, so Elipaz, the, uh, the Temanite, Bildad, and the Shuhite, whatever his name, the, the, the tribe he belonged, and Zophar, the Namathite, did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. So today you and me are going to collectively, in the body of Christ, Sister Steffi, says so beautifully right in the introduction, in the invitation to this meeting. In the body of Christ, all of us are links in the body of Christ. When you and me stand together and voice out that opinion, when somebody prays and somebody says amen to that point of need, immediately this is what is happening, not only in Job's time, but today in your life and my life as well. So now coming to the end of the story, after Job had prayed for his friends, Job 42, that's almost the last chapter in the story of the book of Job. When Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. So how many of you want to have twice as much as you had before? How many of you want to have beautiful answers, much better than what the answer you had or the situation you had earlier? This is a challenge for you, brother and sister, today. According to Job 42.11, all his brothers and sisters, you know, when Job had this point of loss and need, everybody ran away. Everybody forsake, forsaken. He was forsaken, forgotten, chastised, looked down upon, scorned, laughed at, ridiculed. I don't know what all other words you can use to describe that terrible moment in, law, in, in the loss and in the life of Job during that dark period of his life. All the brothers, all the sisters, and everyone who had known him before came back. And now they are coming to feast in the same house. When Job, uh, when, when the Lord turned the fortune of Job once again, yet again. They comforted him and consoled him over all the trouble. The moment he prayed for his friends, God answered the prayer of the friends and made everybody now start looking at Job in a different light. All their lenses were now made washed, cleansed, and now they looked at him differently. Now they came back to console the loss of Job and looked at him with dignity 
and with love and compassion, which they did not have earlier. And after all that trouble, now they come back to be with him. And each of them gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The same thing they could have done earlier, isn't it? Why didn't they do it? The same thing they could have stood and been a solace and a refuge for Job. They did not do it. But when the Lord intervened, when the Lord saw that the love of Job for the Lord was bigger than his loss when he obeyed. And even at that point of need for himself, he forgot his need, his despair, and reached out to pray for his friends. The Lord turned the situation upside down. Are you in a state of need today? Stop worrying about yourself. Start joining me in the intercession for somebody else. But before I, I get that prayer answered, not I am not answering, the Lord is answering. I dare to believe that all the prayers are going to be answered today. When Mr. X is getting the answer, Madam Y is getting the answer without even asking for it. Even before you ask, I will answer. And while you yet speak, I will hear. Isaiah 65, 24 will come to pass today when we dwell on the word of the book of Job and look at Job's life. Job 42, 12 tells us, that is the last part of the, uh, the chapter, right? The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. Now, earlier I told you, remember the statistics. He had 7,000 sheep. Uh, now it has become 14,000 sheep. He had 3,000 camels. Now it has become 6,000 camels. He had 500 oxen. Now it has become 1,000. He had 500 donkeys. Now it's become double. Double restoration. He's got 1,000 donkeys. This is the comparison of what was Job's life earlier and the latter days of Job. Okay? So I just to prove the point, I, I went back to Job 1.3. This is what I gave you in the beginning. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys. He had a large number of servants and he was the greatest man among all the people of the East. He lost it all, went through a cloud, went through a moment of terrible crisis and war in his life. But God gave it all back to him. Seven became 14, three became six, five became 10. Again, five became 10. Look at the statistics here. 500 to 1,000, 7,000 to 14,000. Double restoration is what God beautifully did in the life of Job. Even though he did not ask, Lord, give me 2,000, 1,000. He never said anything. He accepted. God gave, God took away. He never murmured against the Lord. So in conclusion, my brother and sister, I want to remind you of the beautiful, glorious life of Job. And Job died an old man and full of years. I want to challenge you today. Don't die before your time. I've told the Lord, Lord, I want to live out all my life. Till the day when you are ready to call me, let me come at that time, not before that. Let not sickness and worry and disease and pain and loss take me away before that. How can I live out all my life when I put the Lord in my right perspective? Challenges will come. Problems will come. But you have to learn to take it along with the life that God has promised you. God has given to you and to me. Okay, so on that note, I want to say that God is a God of the yesteryears and God is a God of the present moment in our lives. So let us not, let us not be anxious about what we eat and what we drink and what we have, what we don't have. God is the answer to every need. And so giving God the glory, the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac is the same God that you and me worship today. The God in Chennai is the same God who's sitting there right with you in Australia, in, in Malaysia, in Mumbai, in Chennai, wherever. So let's give God the glory and give him a big round of applause because he's the same yes. yesterday, today and forever. Amen. 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 Yes, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. What a Hallelujah. wonderful... Uh, I'll just stop the recording first.